I got it. All right, welcome everybody to another EBFA webinar. My name is Dr. Emily. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in to an EBFA webinar, very special welcome. And if you are returning, of course, we always appreciate your support. So welcome back. Uh, tonight, we have a great speaker, great educator, Dr. Rick Daigle, physical therapist, and uh, we'll introduce him a little bit more in just a moment. Um, the way that the webinars work, just so uh, we're all familiar and on the same page, is that in 2013, we actually have our webinar sponsored, which means that everybody who's tuning in has this opportunity to win some free education and free swag. So tonight's sponsor is Rock Tape. And if you're unfamiliar with Rock Tape, it's a great kinesio tape company, which Rick will be talking about quite a bit as well tonight, considering we're talking about kinesiology taping. We will go through three flash quizzes throughout the webinar. So make sure you have your keypads ready. First person to answer the question wins the Rock Tape swag. We have questions at the end. We'll do about five, 10 minutes Q&A at the end. And all of our webinars are recorded, so please check them out on our YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash EBFA Fitness. So without further ado, we're going to introduce Dr. Rick Daigle. He is a doctor of physical therapy and owner of Game On Physical Therapy in New Jersey and is the founder of Medical Minds in Motion, which is a continuing education company for allied health professionals. Welcome, Dr. Rick Daigle. Thank you, Dr. Emily. I, I appreciate the <clears throat> introduction and the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm, you know, looking forward to you know exposing you guys to you know the movement-based kinesiology taping philosophy, and you know hopefully we're going to have a little bit of fun tonight. And if you guys haven't uh, used any movement-based tape in the in the past, you know you're going to learn about different philosophies from you know comparing rigid-based tapes to movement-based tapes. So I'm I'm excited to be here and. You know, what I'd like to do to, to get started is, you know, introduce, you know, kind of my background a little bit and we'll move on to the next slide and mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, you guys won't feel, oh, we skipped through a slide, um, okay. but here's a little bit about me, um, you know, I'm a, there we go, we're back to where I wanted and hopefully you guys don't feel this way at the end of the webinar and hopefully I'm not going too far over everyone's head or too far below everyone's knees, so hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun tonight. But as Dr. Emily introduced, I'm a physical therapist, uh, the owner and director of Game On Physical Therapy in Ridgewood, New Jersey. I'm a, I'm a big fan of shoulders and elbows, as you can see on that left-hand picture of me working on a shoulder. I specialize really working with baseball players and, and throwing athletes. Um, and obviously to the right, I'm a diehard Red Sox fan. I had to throw this one in because I just got my first tattoo about two weeks ago. I was actually in Denver and figured, why not get the tattoo? So. My philosophy behind treating patients, as you can see here, is, you know, really simple. It's a movement-based philosophy. Uh, I've really tried to get my practice away from, you know, the old-school pain-based model to, to more of the movement and functional-based model. And, you know, you come into my practice, and at any given point, you know, you're going to see patients on the ground rolling. You're going to see them doing get-ups. You're going to see them doing all kinds of different movement drills that we use as assessments, and then we use as treatments. You know, assessing and treating, looking at what's sitting right in front of you and not overthinking it, to me, is the best way to go about patient care. Uh, I'm very vocal about the pain-based model versus the movement-based model. And, you know, the more we focus on movement and we find dysfunction, the better we're going to get our patients. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you can see, those couple pictures, I, I like the wide open space in the clinic um, because really you can walk into my clinic and you'll see two, three patients on the ground rolling. Usually when new patients walk in and they, and they peek into the, the clinic floor and they look at what's going on and they're thinking, well, that's not typically what physical therapy looks like to me. And, and we get them in and you know hopefully change their perception of, of what physical therapy is really all about and what movement-based models are really all about. So again, as you can see, I like the wide open space. So the question is, why are we here today? And, and we're going to talk about tape. And obviously, we're not going to focus on talking about duct tape. But uh, duct tape, to me, is probably the single greatest invention known to man. So I kind of had to throw a picture in there. But you know, so we're not going to talk about rigid stabilization type tape. We're, we're going to talk about movement-based, fascial-based, uh, 
skin-based tapes. And as you can see in these two pictures, it's a, a very functional way of taping. We're taking our swimmer, we're looking at different arm fascial chains, we're looking at different, you know, lower extremity fascial chains, and you know, finding areas of dysfunction in the patient. And as we get further into the webinar, we're going to talk about the mechanics of the tape and how it functions and why it functions. But we're really going to focus on the, the movement-based taping models. There are organizations out there that teach taping. A lot of them teach diagnostic-specific taping. Some of them teach movement-based taping. Um, specifically, Rock Tape teaches a movement-based tape, and I teach a movement-based tape. And, you know, you, we have functional uses for taping. We have, obviously, the picture to the left, Carrie Walsh. You know, she's a famous volleyball player. She's kind of in the poster child for, you know, for taping. And, you know, so we can use tape from different methods for our performance enhancement. We can use tape for injury prevention. We can use tape for injury management. There are just tons of functional uses for the tape. And when we start to move on and, and look at different alternative uses for tape, you know, I'm sure some of you are probably sitting in your chairs laughing right now, but this actually isn't a joke. Um, there are brands of tape that are used for horses and dogs. Uh, there's actually a brand of tape called Equitex. Um, never actually used it myself, but uh, you know, it's a it's a functional form of treatment that you know, skin is skin. Whether it's a horse, whether it's a dog, whether it's a human, skin is skin. And if we can address the skin, we can address change. So, what I'd like to do is spend a little, just a couple minutes, with talking about the history and, and the background of the tape. So we're going to sit here on this slide for a minute or two. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been exposed to tape, and maybe some of you haven't been exposed to tape, but. You know, back in the in the 70s, chiropractor Kento Kase, he's the one who created the philosophy and originally created kinesio tape. And you know, his idea was, you know, the skin being the largest organ of the body, let's use the skin as a modality for healing. Uh, the tape has been around since the 70s, but it really didn't get very hot until the 2008 Olympics. And obviously, we talked about Kerry Walsh a, a slide or two ago, and. You know, the, the beach volleyball players, Kerry Walsh and Misty May, they were on NBC, and NBC picked up this new magical tape of what is this doing, and, you know, it started to get a lot of play in the public eye, and then, obviously, you know, the last Summer Olympics, 2012, I mean, everyone had tape on. I think it was, you know, every single Chinese diver had the tan color tape on their back. And every sport, you could see tape on, on the different athletes, and I remember there was one specific picture that was floating around Facebook for a while, and it was an Italian, I believe he was an Italian cyclist, that it took a, a pretty nasty digger in one of the road races, and the back of his jersey was all ripped up. And on the back of the jersey, as he's getting back on the bike, all you saw were a couple strips of the nice bright blue, blue argyle tape, which is one of the tapes that, that rock tape makes. But, you know, it just got a lot of play in the 2012 Olympics, and, you know, there was a lot of you know, controversy behind, you know, what does the tape do? Does it really do anything? Is it too much of a performance enhancement tool? And, you know, you know, speaking of that, I, I do know that the International Olympic Committee is discussing possibly limiting the use of tape for the 2016 Olympics because they view it as potentially too much of a performance enhancement tool, which I don't necessarily know if I agree with that. I, I'd probably go along the lines of, you know, Maybe they should stick to focusing on blood doping and, and steroid use for, as performance enhancement tools. But, you know, that being said, they're discussing it. There are <clears throat> tons of brands of, of tape that are on the market now. You know, Kinesio tape is the one that we know and that everyone's heard about. And we always call it Kinesio taping. But what I want to get through to everyone tonight and what I want you guys to really focus on is not thinking about it as Kinesio taping. Think about it as Kinesiology taping. You know, Kinesio Tape has done a fantastic job branding themselves. And I was teaching at a course uh, a couple months ago, and I had an attendee of one of my courses say, you know, Rick, a, a great way of looking at it is, you know, look, about, look at Q-tips. You know, Q-tips are cotton swabs, but everyone calls them Q-tips. Or Kleenex, everyone, you know, tissue paper, everyone calls it Kleenex because those companies have done just a fantastic job branding themselves. So what I really want to do is drive home the mentality that we're talking about kinesiology taping. And there are many philosophies behind kinesiology taping. And if you're talking kinesio tape, you're talking the kinesio tape philosophy. And they have their philosophy. Rock tape has their philosophy. I have my philosophy. And what we're really going to spend time talking about tonight is just the overall spectrum of, of kinesiology taping. Um, rock tape is is what I use, and I tell this to all my course attendees. I, you know what? I use this brand because it works. Uh, 
what I did when I first came across rock, across rock tape a few years ago. <clears throat> what I did was I, I bought rolls of rock tape, rolls of Kinesio, rolls of Spider Tech, and, and rolls of KT tape. You know, those are all the more commonly used tapes. And, and what I did, you know, for those of you, you know, who do know me, know them. And personally, I'm an orthopedic nightmare and have plenty of knee issues. So what I did is I did my own little internal clinical study. I taped up my right knee with rock tape and taped up my left knee with Kinesio. Spent a couple of days with that on. And then I mixed and matched. I did Spider Tech with Kinesio. I did KT tape with rock tape. I made sure every brand went on my right knee. I made sure every brand went on my left knee. And from that point, I knew I needed to only use rock tape in the clinic because I felt like it was working. I got more feedback and I got better results. Now, when we're in the clinic, this is obviously what we really want to do. We, we go back to duct tape again, and we always have that patient who we just want to stick a piece of tape over their mouth, but we refrain ourselves from doing that. But uh, we all have patients like that. So we'll talk about some of the different mechanics of, of what the tape actually does. And, and first and foremost, I want to talk about how the tape decompresses. So if we look on the left-hand side of, of this slide, we look at, we're just going to simply talk about fascial adhesion. We have fascial adhesion, we've got compression of skin, fascia, muscle, and we don't have the greatest fluid exchange. So we find ways to decompress the tissue and allow for increased vascularity. You, know, you put tape on, a, on the skin, and some people will say, well, how can tape really affect change? And as we get into the mechanics in a little bit, we'll talk about that even more. But you add tape to the skin, you, know, you put the person in the proper position, and as the person goes through movement, you know, you'll see the tape form little convolutions and how it's actually drawing and lifting the skin up. So when we lift the skin, we increase vascular flow, we increase lymphatic, lymphatic flow, flow, we separate superficial fascia from deep fascia, and when we increase circulation, we automatically increase tissue temperature. And as we all know, if we can increase tissue temperature, we can allow for you know, better fluidity of fascial tissue, better fluidity of muscles, and you know, from the standpoint of, of assisting with healing. You know, not only we're going to get increased tissue temperature, but you know, we're also going to get you know increased um, fluid exchange, which is going to pick up inflammatory cells. And we talked about Dr. Costa's philosophy behind you know developing the tape, and his whole philosophy was, let's use the skin, the largest organ in our body. You know, why not use it as a modality for healing? You know, great quote by Gil Headley here, a very famous anatomist. The skin is very much the skin of the superficial fascia, and they are thoroughly mechanically related. So if we can address skin, we know that there are connections between the skin and layers of fascia. So we're going to be able to directly affect change to our fascial tissue by addressing the skin. I mean, it's what we do every day as a manual therapist. We put our hands on patients, and we address the skin. So why not have a modality such as tape where the patient can have the tape on their skin or the athlete can have the tape on their skin for a longer period of time. Other mechanics of the tape, and I talk a lot about in my courses when I'm teaching, is proprioception. You know, research does show that kinesthetic guidance can be translated into behavior 30 times faster than visual guidance and many thousands of times faster than audio guidance. So by putting tape on someone's skin, we're affecting proprioception. We know for a fact that nerve endings attach to our skin. Uh, I kind of, you know, I'll tell patients, it's kind of like when you, you, know, you bang your elbow up against the wall and you rub it for a few seconds, you feel better. It's because you're numbing the nerve endings, so you don't sense pain quite as much you're using your, your gait control theory of pain. But we can use the tape in that aspect, or we can use the tape to really provide increased proprioception to fascial chains, to functional lines, to really promote the person's ability to move better and move more fluidly. So, you know, we get the fascial lift, we increase our proprioception, we've talked about increasing tissue temperature, we've talked about increasing circulation, and we're also going to, you know, increase the ability to generate afferent stimulation. So, you know, the ultimate really standpoint is that tape can do many, many different things. So now we're going to have a little bit of a flash quiz, so hopefully you guys are paying attention. I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Emily, and she'll let you guys know what the first quiz is about. All right. So again, the way that the flash quizzes work is the first person to answer the question, type it in. Um, there's a questions uh, box on the side of the control panel. Type in your answer. First person to get it correct will win some rock tape swag. First question, the gastrocnemius directly influences how many joints. 
Again, the gastrocnemius directly influences how many joints. Let's see. Oh, yes. Jennifer Barlow, congratulations. The gastrocnemius directly influences three joints. Many people think it only influences two. I go into this into great detail in my workshops, and it's one of my uh, areas I guess I'm passionate about is to educate people. Gastrocnemius influences the knee, the ankle, and the subtalar joint because it inserts onto the calcaneus. All right, continuing on, Rick. Awesome, great question. I, I agree too. I use that in in my practice a lot. People always forget subtalar joint. So um, back into tape precautions and contraindications. And I usually, when I teach my courses, spend quite a bit of time talking about precautions and, and contraindications. I won't bore you guys too much with this. And some of these are hard and fast, and, and some of these are, eh, just keep in the back of your mind. You know, the, the first one, and I put the first one up there, active chemo slash radiation. There are organizations that say, if you're currently under treatment for any form of cancer, you shouldn't tape. There are other organizations that say it's perfectly fine to tape. Um, I play Switzerland on this one. I stay kind of middle of the road. If I've got a patient who comes in who, you know, maybe they're being treated for, you know, some form of breast cancer and I'm seeing them for a plantar fasciitis, I'm going to tape their foot up most probably. That's not a problem because I'm far enough away from this, the, you know, the, the area of, of treatment. But if it's getting close to the area of treatment, I'm just going to err on the side of caution on that one. Though that being said, I was teaching in Houston last year and had a couple therapists from the MD Anderson Cancer Institute, and which was one of the top cancer hospitals in the country, and they said, no, it's perfectly fine to tape your patients. Have at it. Uh, pregnancy, obviously you wouldn't want to provide a lot of over proprioception and facilitation to you know, the abdomen of someone who's pregnant, just again, to keep that in the back of your mind. Sensitive skin, this is probably the question that I get asked the most. Oh, I see a lot of Medicare patients. Can I tape them? Well, absolutely. You just got to assess their skin like you would assess any patient. I'll usually put a little piece of tape on the forearm at the beginning of the session and just see how they respond to it. And next time they come in, then I'll probably do some more, you know, functional tape jobs. But you just got just to be careful. If they have sensitive skin, be careful. Some patients get skin irritation. There's that patient who comes in post-op and they get a lot of irritation from the surgical tape that was on. That person's probably not going to handle the tape very well, but it's a very small percentage of the population. Ulnar side of the elbow, posterior knee, again, those are just to be careful. There's a lot of neurovascular vascular structures in those areas, so ulnar side of the elbow because of the ulnar nerve, obviously. Posterior knee, there's just a ton of stuff going on back there. So we're just going to be a little, little bit careful, maybe with the amount of stretch or as how aggressive we're going to be with those two areas. Diabetes, kidney disease, and, and you know, CHF, heart failure, those are just, keep them in the back of your mind. These are patients that probably have, or, you know, clients that probably have some sort of fluid overload. So we just got to be a little bit careful. I don't really think this slide is going to surprise many people, and I don't really think you need to be a rocket scientist to figure this one out. You don't tape over a DVT, you don't tape over open wounds, and you don't tape over infection. It's kind of common sense. If someone's got a DVT, the last thing I want to do is promote circulation in that area. Now, we'll talk about a lot of do's and don'ts of the tape, but I'm really going to focus here for a minute or two on, on how not to tape, because there, while there really is not a right way or a correct way to tape, there absolutely is a wrong way to tape. Uh, you never want to use the tape to put a person in a position. And usually when I'm teaching, I, I demonstrate this, so I'll, I'll try to describe what I'm talking about. you got a person who comes in. Maybe they have an extremely weak anterior tip. Maybe they've got a foot drop for whatever reason. I could, If I wanted to, I could create a pseudo AFO with the tape, and you know, I'd passively or act put them in the dorsiflexion, you know, tape up over the, you know, the anterior side of, of, you know, anterior tip to give them some support to kind of hold that, you know, foot into a dorsiflex position if they have a foot drop. Um, I could put them in a completely plantar flexed position and put the tissue on stretch and tape over the anterior tip to provide a little bit of proprioceptive feedback to assist with that person's movement. But what I mean by you never use the tape to put a person in a position is you never attach the tape, in this example, to some, the dorsum of someone's foot and pull them up into dorsiflexion with the tape. That's going to put a significant amount of stretch on the end of the tape, and I promise you that's the best way to cause someone to get a blister. 
I was I tell this story all the time. I was teaching in Los Angeles a few years back, and it was my first time, you know, teaching a, a taping course. And this PT student who was taking the class came up to me and said, "I got a bunch of blisters on my shoulder from someone taping me." And she said, "Is this right?" And I said, "Absolutely not." So I asked her, you know, what happened, and she said, "Well, it's it's simply because he was using the tape." and cranking me into retraction and bringing me into a certain position with the tape. You don't do that. You always have the person assume the position first. So you never stretch the ends of the tape. You never shear the skin with the tape. And you never blow dry the tape. I see a lot of high school kids in my practice. And we all know high school kids and common sense don't always mix. So I really drive home, don't blow dry the tape. You use the hot setting on a blow dryer with the, with the tape, you're basically going to turn into a glue gun and cause some skin burns. And I've seen that happen before. Now, correct methodology, you always assess the patient. Not every person, not every patient, not every client, not every athlete is going to be appropriate for tape. If you assess the person and you see how they move and you find where their dysfunction is, you develop a taping technique to go along with their corrective exercises, a taping technique that's going to work in conjunction with your manual therapy. You, know, you always prep the skin. Some people have oily skin. you got to prep it a little bit. And you always put, you know, 99% of the time you're going to put the skin on stretch. You always want to make sure that tissue is on stretch so you don't restrict range of motion. And also the, the research does show that by putting the skin on stretch and putting a piece of tape over it, we're going to get greater lift to the skin as the person goes through movement. Now looking at rock tape specifically, and, and again, these are really some differences between rock tape and you know the classically known kinesio tape. Uh, rock tape is 97% organic cotton, 3% nylon, so there's no latex in it. Very easy, very safe for your skin, withstands fluids. I tell my patients, this is going to stay on for three, four, five days. And I, and I talk to clinicians all the time who use Kinesio or K-Tape or Spider Tech, and they say, I can't get this stuff to stay on for more than a day. And we'll just switch to this stuff, and it's going to stay on. Uh, so it withstands fluids very well. Uh, it has 180% elasticity. What this means is if you cut a, a strip of tape that's a foot long, you can stretch it up to about 180% of its resting length. This is compared to 135% of, of Kinesio. Uh, if you cut a piece of tape and look at the back of it, there's a plow pattern. It's the weave of the tape, so it, it's meant to increase fluid exchange. Uh, they've created a stronger adhesive. Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what the adhesive content is exactly made out of, because it's kind of like the Colonel Sanders recipe. It's a little bit of a secret, because um, I don't know it. Um, but again, it's a stronger adhesive, so you put the tape on, you rub it in for a couple seconds, and it's kind of like that old, you know, uh, infomercial, set it and forget it. it. It's on. And they created the tape to also have a tighter weave, which is really meant to have increased comfort. You know, because one of the biggest complaints of patients has always been in the past with some of the other brands is it starts to irritate. It gets, gets uncomfortable. You know, so by having a tighter weave, it's going to allow for, for more comfort. You know, when, it, when all is said and done, there's a lot of differences between, between rock tape and you know, the, the two biggest really for me are, are first and foremost the extensibility. You have greater ability for range of motion. So we all, you know, for those of us who are in patient care, one, if a patient comes in and they have decreased range of motion, one of our goals for that session is to increase their range of motion. If I tape them in the beginning of the session, my goal is to get more range of motion before they leave. If the tape has enough extensibility, that if the person increases their range, the tape is going to increase its extensibility and it's going to be able to move through that range. That's important to me because I don't want to limit motion. If I restrict motion or limit motion, I'm preventing a person from their ability to move. The other big part of the tape is the grab, and, and this is where the adhesive you know, really comes into play. In this you know, graph, shorter is better. Rock tape grabs the skin much faster than your typical kinesiology tape. You know, I, I can't, you know, speak exactly for, you know, kinesio tape when I say this, but I believe they do tell their course attendees that you want to rub the skin, the tape, for 90 seconds for the adhesive to really set. In, in my busy practice, I don't really feel like sitting there and rubbing the tape for 90 seconds, nor am I going to make my patients sit there and rub the tape for a minute and a half. I've got better use of my time and better use of patient's time. With rock tape, it's just going to stick a whole lot faster. Rub it for a couple seconds, and it's on. So I'll now toss it back to Dr. Emily for our second flash quiz. All right. So second quiz, get your fingers ready, type the answer. Again, sponsored by Rock Tape, win some Rock Tape 
swag. First person to answer correct. Which AD ductor muscle is the first to activate during normal human locomotion? Again, which AD ductor muscle is the first to activate during normal? Oh, congratulations, Brandon Solomas. It is the AD ductor longus. Brandon is winning some rock tag. Rock take swag. Good job. Nice. Congratulations, Brandon. So general guidelines. This is kind of where I say, you know, you, you put in a, a cook in the kitchen, give them the tools, and let them just kind of run with it. This is the way that I present taping. There really are no rules. I can't sit here and tell someone every time you see a patient with diagnosis X, you should tape Y because it just doesn't work that way. You can have six patients sitting in front of you that all have, and I hate to use this word, but they all have quote unquote impingement. You know, we knew, we know impingement is caused by a million different things, and it's finding the dysfunction that's causing it, so we treat the dysfunction. Guidelines. These are questions that I always get asked. Where do you attach the tape? Where do you end the tape? How much stretch do I put on the tape? What kind of cut do I use? And you can ask me these questions until you're blue in the face, and I'm going to give you the same exact answer every single time. It depends because, again, it goes back to no two people look exactly the same. Um, one common misconception, and there's newer research that's starting to come out that actually proves this. And, you know, for the most part, the direction of the pole on the tape does not matter. You know, kinesio in the past has always been very big in the, if you want to, quote, unquote, inhibit a muscle, you know, you go from distal to proximal. If you want to, quote, unquote, facilitate a muscle, you go from proximal to distal because their philosophy was the tapes recoiling back in the same direction as the concentric contraction of the muscle. There's research now that shows this is not the case. It's not the direction of the tape that matters. It's more so the amount of stretch you apply on the tape that increases proprioception, which then increases further assistance to the muscle. So I tell people, get away from worrying about direction. Now, I like to, you know, on a lot of pieces of tape, start at the hand or start at the foot because it's easy to go that direction because if you run out of space, you just got to keep the tape going. Um, edema control, to me, though, that's when tape does, the direction does matter. And we'll go over an example of edema control in a little bit when we talk about some examples. But you've got to attach the tape proximal to distal with a little bit of light stretch on it because the tape does want to recoil back to its original attachment. And you want to stimulate fluid going north. If someone's got a swollen knee from surgery, I don't want to draw the fluid down to their foot and ankle. It's kind of a problem. Um, the one, you know, kind of anomaly of that is, you know, take your patient who had a radical mastectomy and maybe they're there for a shoulder problem and they've got a lot of swelling in their shoulder. I'm not going to draw the fluid towards the axilla because if that person's ha have had that a, uh, you know, full um, lymph node resection, I'm not going to bring the fluid back to where there's a lack of lymph nodes. So what I'll probably do is, is draw the fluid south down towards the groin where the next concentration of, of lymph nodes will be. So the whole point of, of this slide really is don't focus too much on the direction of the tape versus the amount of stretch that you put on the tape. Uh, we've talked in some of the previous slides, again, reasons for taping, and, and I like to kind of review just kind of over and over again when I teach is, you know, why are we using this tape? Because you're going to have to explain that to your clients. You're going to have to explain, explain that to your patients. You know, increase performance. We give support to the fascial tissue. We're going to increase performance. Increase vascularity. It's going to pick up inflammatory cells. That's going to increase tissue temperature. Uh, all things that are going to help with functionality. Decompression of trigger points. Decompression of, you know, restrictive fascial tissue. Uh, and then, of course, edema control. You know, when we have fluid sitting in an area for a longer period of time, you know, we need to find ways to get that out of there. And, and yes, we use our manual therapy, we use our movement-based therapy, but we can also use taping. So these next couple slides are all kind of some, you know, e examples. And, you know, I use this edema control, you know, as Dr. Perry would say, a nice boom moment. And, you know, this is really... And I, I say this exactly verbatim when I teach a class. I said, if you think I'm full of crap after, you know, learning about taping, it's perfectly fine. But next time a patient comes in that they've got a huge bruise on their leg, you tape them up with this edema tape. And I guarantee you the next time they come in a couple days later, you're going to see, as you can see in the picture on this left-hand side, you know, the outline of where the tape was. And, and to me, that's evidence-based practice. 
you know, I look at evidence-based practice and is twofold. To the right, it's our research that says X, Y, and Z. And to the left is clinical experience. And the best form of evidence-based practice is having that pendulum swing where it's the same speed going back and forth and getting a little bit of research and getting a little bit of clinical evidence and clinical experience. So if you're not buying it, that the fact that tape's working, try this edema control next time you've got someone with a lot of swelling or a lot of bruising, and you're going to see it work. And I wouldn't suggest going home tonight and punching someone and causing a bruise um, and then trying it out. But uh, next time a person comes in and they've got this situation, give it a shot, and, and your person's going to be pretty impressed, and you're going to be pretty impressed. We can use the tape for patients with radicular symptoms. You know, when we have someone who's got uh, nerve entrapment, obviously nerve entrapment doesn't always just happen at one site. You know, we've got fascial limitations that go through dermatomes, that go through myotomes, uh, that go through different radicular pathways. So we're going to tape along our radicular pathways to increase circulation and increase fascial mobility all the way from the neck back to the, you know, down to the hands and, and down through the spine. Because again, we want to address as much of the skin, A, as close to our central nervous system as possible, but also as close to our peripheral nervous system as possible. So here's just, you know, one example of taping ridiculous symptoms. And, you know, we, we kind of move on and we can see other examples where, you know, we look at, you know, the, the big part of this one is looking at the lower half, looking at, you know, our femoral distribution. You know, so it's all a matter of assessing where the patient's symptoms are. We have someone who comes in with ridiculous symptoms. We know where those ridiculous symptoms go. We'll tape along that area to increase circulation, increase functionality. Uh, here's an example of our, you know, lateral fascia line. When I teach, I teach based off of Thomas Meyer's anatomy trains and his different lines of tissue. And the lateral line, you know, obviously your runners, maybe your swimmers with IT band issues, uh, you know, junction of vastus lateralis and ITB. Um, but again, I'm not just going to do a piece of tape over the IT band. I'm going to keep it going down the peroneals and down towards the malleolus because the tissue keeps continuing. If I wanted to, I could keep that tape going north, get past the greater troch, you know, go up over the iliac crest and get the person standing in a little bit of side bending and keep that tissue coming up their, their lateral thorax, maybe get the lats a little bit because, again, that tissue doesn't stop. So the more surface area that we can cover, the better. So I give a lot of examples of, of taping different fascia lines, and you know, for me, this one in particular is, is a pretty good, uh, pretty good bang for your buck. Uh, other types of tape that I use, uh, here's my squat tape. Uh, I use six. It's a. I also call it a six-point brace tape. So we start with the base foundation. This is the person that maybe, you know, maybe when they're squatting, they, they kind of slam into valgus a little bit, or they, you know, have, maybe have a little bit of patellar tracking issues, or they have a little discomfort in their knee. This tape job is going to give them some good general support for the knee. So I start the foundation with two black strips. And what we do, it doesn't matter which one you start with, but you can see I've got one strip that's going from you know, kind of, you know, medial thigh, vastus medialis, you know, adductors. It comes across over the, the lateral joint line and then comes back across midline and finishes off close to our, you know, our posterior tib and medial side of the lower leg. Second strip starts kind of at the junction of VL and, and the uh, IT band, and it comes around the exact opposite, and it finishes pointing towards our peroneals. And then do the, the purple and the orange perpendicular strips are um, decompression strips over the quad tendon and patellar tendon, tibial tube, that area, just to give some nice direct lift over, you know, areas that tend to have some, some tissue restrictions to allow for better patellar mobility. And then it's, it's hard to see in this picture, but I've got a medial strip and a lateral strip that are acting as MCL and LCL stabilization tapes. Those two pieces of tape, because they're on the medial and lateral part of the joint, I'll tape the person in extension. The other pieces of tape, I'll tape them in a flexed position. In a flexed position, it's not going to restrict their flexion extension. But with the lateral and medial tapes, if I tape them in full, if I tape them in flexion, I'm going to have a hard time kind of coming around the curve and the bend. And we know that taping lateral and medial joint line that's not going to restrict that person's movement. So it's another one of my, you know, go-to tape jobs that I use with a lot of patients, especially someone who's uh, post-op ACL as they start to do some, some squatting techniques. But probably out of every tape job that I do, this is the one that I get the most bang for my buck. And, of course, I had to throw this one in there for, for Dr. Emily since we are, uh, you know, Evidence-Based Fitness Academy and 
and we, you know, we are looking at the foot and ankle. So um, for me, plantar fasciitis, I don't really care if someone has plantar fasciitis. I care about why they have plantar fasciitis. And a lot of times, not every time, a person with plantar fasciitis has a deficient posterior tip, uh, causing the arch to collapse and, and, and whatnot, and they develop a lot of stress with plantar fascia. Also, a lot of times, and we you know, misdiagnose, quote unquote, plantar fasciitis, when in all actuality, it's Fletcher Hallis' longest, that's the, uh, that's the issue. But that's a story for another day. Focusing on the posterior tip, I'll start a piece of tape with a little bit of stretch to give some proprioception to the posterior tip. So I'll attach at, you know, the, the fifth met heads, come around across the arch, uh, over the medial ankle, medial malleolus, and then up along the posterior tip. So, and I really like to make sure I'm covering, and, and those of us back from, you know, PT school, if those of us who are PTs out there remember the acronym, you know, Tom, Dick, and Very Nervous Harry from all the structures going on the medial ankle. I want to make sure this piece of tape covers that, and I'm applying some proprioception to the posterior tip. You got to build that piece of tape first. That, to me, is is the key and and, and really the, the difference maker. Then I go two strips that start from the met heads and come down to the calcaneus with a light amount of stretch. Make sure the person's uh, in full dorsiflexion and also toe extension because we want to put the plantar fascia on stretch. I go one piece of tape from kind of first through third met heads down to the calcaneus. And then the same thing on the other side, kind of third through fifth mets down to the, the calcaneus. And then we finish off with three strips of tape with a good amount of stretch to it that's going to act as a transverse arch support tape. So we kind of do what we call a Band-Aid technique where we tear the paper in the middle and scoop it around the first and the fifth mets. So we're giving that patient some, some transverse arch support. And this, to me, is probably one of the biggest game changers uh, with taping jobs that I've come across and get the most bang for my buck and patients who have the severely painful plantar fasciitis, you know, you do all your other work with them and you tape them up and the next thing you know, they're standing up and they feel immediate relief and pain. So, you know, this is one that if, you know, you go practice it a little bit, this is one where you, you'll, you'll really be able to get a lot of bang for your buck. I mentioned earlier uh, anatomy trains. This to me, if you haven't bought this book, you need to buy this book. It's important that you understand fascial tissue and different chains of fascial tissue in order to tape a person properly. Um, one of my favorite quotes I got listed here, whatever else they may be doing individually, muscles also operate across functionally integrated body-wide continuities within the fascial webbing. So in order to address fascia, we've got to understand it. Uh, in order to tape properly, we've got to understand fascia. And if this is a book that you don't have, I highly, highly suggest picking this book up, getting the posters, putting them up in your gym, put the posters up in your clinic because you're going to constantly go back and, and explain to patients, you know, okay, you've got a foot and ankle problem, but here's why I'm looking at your neck. Or you got a shoulder problem, here's why I'm looking at your opposite hip. And you can really show them how the chains of fascial tissue actually act uh, as functional lines. You know, that's, that's going to be kind of our, you know, overview tonight of, of taping. I know it was oh, probably a lot of information in a short period of time, and a little bit was, was generic. But just to give you guys some, some kind of just initial ideas of, of what taping is all about and why we don't tape for diagnosis, rather we tape for the person sitting in front of us. Uh, it's really important, and I've said this numerous times, that you assess the person, and you don't just tape to tape. You have a reason for why you tape. And it needs to work in conjunction with everything else that you're doing. If you just tape the tape, it's not going to work. But if you tape a person a certain way and it works with your manual therapy and it works with your corrective exercises and it works with their home program, the person's going to get better. So, you know, that last slide, that was all my contact info. Uh, my email is rick at medicalmindsinmotion.com. You, you guys can email me at any point with any questions. Uh, you can find all of our courses, www.medicalmindsinmotion.com. Uh, excited to say that you know, coming up in June, Dr. Emily is going to be teaching a, a barefoot rehab uh, course through us. So you know, keep an eye out for you know, her putting out you know, when she's going to be teaching. You can go to our website. You can find her. Uh, a lot of you guys that follow me and also follow Dr. Emily probably follow Dr. Perry as well too. Uh, he's teaching his primal rehab course through us. So We've got a lot of different exciting courses, and our philosophy is really to bring in the best of the best and put out high-quality material and have fun. And, you know, thank you guys for listening in, and thanks, Dr. Emily, for having me on. And 
Uh, we're going to go, I guess, one more flash quiz, and then we're going to open up for some uh, questions for a little while. Great. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, I like that plantar fascial uh, slide at the end, and I uh, definitely agree with it that post-tib post association you spoke about, which I wish more people understood. Um, all right. So last flash quiz. Don't anybody drop off yet. We have one more question and ability to win some rock tape swag. Last question again, first person to answer correctly wins. We have eccentrically, the soleus muscle controls what motion of the subtalar joint? Eccentrically, the soleus muscle controls what motion at the subtalar joint? Flexion, no, no, no. Yes, Steve Smith, congratulations. The soleus muscle controls subtalar joint eversion eccentrically. Good job, Steve Smith. That eversion is part of pronation. So if you were thinking pronation, you are on the same line. Your thought process was great. All right, so we are going to go into some questions. If you guys have any questions for Rick, we will enter those now. And then, as I had mentioned, all of the um, webinars are recorded. So if you want to tune in again or check out any other ones that we have done, we have some great educators that we always have. Um, tuning in. And as Rick had mentioned, I'm very excited to be doing a barefoot training for a rehab setting. So barefoot science in a rehab setting under Medical Minds in Motion. So we have a question. Do you ever combine a rock tape with any other tape in a treatment session? That's a great question. And absolutely. Um, and I'll give one simple example. Uh, a lot of the times, what I'll use with a lateral ankle sprain, uh, I'll use a, a McConnell tape or a rigid athletic tape or a Luco tape to generate a, a posterior glide of the distal tib fib to lock down that lateral joint. And then on top of that, I might do some tapes over the peroneals and, and IT band to generate some proprioception to our peroneals because we know if, you know, ATFL, CFL, are dysfunctional and not stabilizing the lateral ankle, if we can get a nice posterior glide to the distal tib fib and we can get some proprioception to the peroneals, we can give that person more lateral stability. And, and I've actually done that quite frequently with some of my athletes with like a grade one or grade one plus brain where they need to get back out on the field or they need to get back to practice. And I can get a lot of bang for my buck with, with using a different combination of different types of tapes. So uh, that's one example where I'll, I'll combine the tape. Um, so, yeah, you absolutely can. All right, great. Um, I actually have a question until we see if anyone else tunes it in. Um, you showed your squatting, that squatting tape that you did. And uh, do you have any studies that compare, compare um, a brace to your taping? Bracing versus the taping technique. On which one? Uh, would... That's a that's. A... Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's that's oh. a great question. Um, I have not seen any myself. It's actually, and it's funny you ask that question. I've actually started uh, my own kind of little study here in the clinic that I want to develop that into a further study, um, comparing your generic kind of you know, knee stabilizing brace to how the tape actually works. Um, I think we're going to get a little bit of mix of results because, you know, your patients with significant, you know, ligamentous instability, you're probably going to need that, that brace. But your patients with just a little bit of generic arthritis or a little bit of generic instability, I think the tape can offer us more functionality because we're going to still get that increased circulation and we're still going to allow for the proprioception. So we're going to get the stabilization at the same time that we're going to get the decompression, whereas just a, a rigid brace is just going to hold the person in the position versus the tape is going to allow for movement. It's going to stabilize, but it's also going to help with pain relief and fluid exchange. So um, I don't have any specific uh, studies that, that look at that, you know, comparison, uh, but I think it's a really neat study to look into and kind of see what results that will come out of it. Okay. Yeah, I've seen... Um... Kind of your traditional athletic tape versus, uh, especially for the ankle. So a lot of ankle bracing where they'll com compare athletic tape um, to an ankle brace and kind of, you know, does it really limit range of motion? But 
not too much with the um, kinesiology taping and in the techniques that you're talking about. So it's not just a, you know, one tape up the post tib, but something much more uh, functional based. Mm -hmm. So very interesting. All right. So let's see. Question. 75% stretch to facilitate a muscle or chain? That's a, a good question. And, you know, some of the, the kinesio philosophies have always been, you know, 50 to 75% stretch to, quote unquote, facilitate a muscle. Um, I don't typically anymore stretch that much on a piece of tape um, simply because that. I have seen, and, and Rock Tape agrees with this one, you know, you put too much stretch and it can cause some sh some skin shearing. So we're really going to focus on a little bit of extra stretch, maybe 25% or so, maybe 50% or so at, at the most to generate some increased proprioception. And, and I like to get away from using the words facilitation or in in inhibition because the newer research that has come out, and a lot of it is from Kinesio, is that the tape doesn't actually quote unquote facilitate, but when you increase a little bit of stretch in the tape, you do increase the proprioceptive feedback, and we know that if you increase proprioceptive feedback, you're gonna allow for greater muscle function. So I, I typically stay away from stretching that kind of aggressive, um, especially with using rock tape because of, of the way that the tape is created, uh, with the, you know, the amount of stretch it has. You know, rock tape's got the 180% stretch, versus kinesio is 135%. So if you stretch 75% of rock tape compared to something else, it's going to be that much more aggressive. So you can go 25, maybe 50% stretch and basically be like you were stretching kinesio or KT or spider tech, 75, 80, 90%. Okay, excellent. So we'll do one more question. Um, last question is, will it help with lymphatic massage? Or I guess be an adjunct Great. to lymphatic massage. Great question, and absolutely. Uh, you use the edema control tapes that uh, I showed earlier. Um, I'm not going to sit here and claim to be a lymphatic expert. I don't do lymphedema therapy, but I know plenty of therapists and plenty of practitioners that do. And, you know, the edema control tapes are widely used in lymph control and, and lymph, lymph management. The, the biggest thing is, if they have functioning lymph nodes, you want to angle the fluid back towards the concentration of lymph nodes to just reload the system with the fluid. So we don't want it to pocket or pull up. So, you know, you can use the edema control tape that I showed in small strips and large strips um, across entire chains, arms, legs, any different position. And, you know, A, from my standpoint, I've seen excellent results. And I know a lot of, you know, highly skilled, excellent lymphatic therapists across the country that, you know, will use their manual techniques for lymphatic drainage. Then they'll tape for decompressing the skin, and they'll even use the compression sleeves over that. So you'll get the double whammy effect of the tape actually affecting the skin, but also the compression sleeves causing the compression to really assist with pushing fluid out. So it's an, a very effective um, lymphatic control technique. Okay, excellent. An excellent question. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, there's one more. <laughs> Because it's a really Go good question, um, and I, I, I can I can I can I can stay on all night. I don't care. Well, I know you can, Rick, but <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, all right. So, last question, really, last question is: You mentioned a contraindication for pregnancy, but Rock Tape has a pregnancy application. Is that the, an awesome question? Um, absolutely, but they use a very light amount of stretch over the abdomen or no stretch at all. So, the, and I probably should have been more clear, with a pregnancy application over the person's abdomen, you don't want to put aggressive stretch. You don't want to apply too much proprioception. And you just want to be careful with that. Um, so you can definitely put the tape on with a very light amount of stretch to apply just some, some fascial support. So absolutely, they've got a, a great PDF that you can print out with you know, some abdominal tapes. Uh, they've got their plantar fascia tape. Um, SI joint stabilization tapes. You just want to be careful ar around someone's abdomen who's pregnant to not provide too much proprioceptive feedback. But that's a great question. Okay, excellent. So again, thank you so much, um, Rick, for being a guest educator. 
And um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. For those who won, congratulations, and I hope you enjoy your rock take swag. Uh, we have a great lineup for June, which will be Dr. Evan Osar is coming back, and he's talking about um, uh, the hip and hip dysfunction. So it's going to be, be another great one. He did it um, several months back, I believe four months back. But he is back, and, um, again, you will have a chance to win some free education or free products so again rick thank you so much and um if you could give your email one more time for everybody or your website uh my email is is rick at medical minds in motion dot com um or if you forget that just go to our website and you'll find my email on our website and by all means if you have any questions you know shoot me an email you know without a doubt and you know, thanks, Dr. Emily, again for for having me on, and uh, I had a, had a blast with this. And hopefully, you guys all got a little, you know, a couple little tidbits of information out of this. Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night, and we'll see you soon.